Kia ora, Lyndon. Kia ora, Jonathan. It is so good to have you here. Uh, Lyndon and I have been friends for, for many, many years. Mm. And uh, in fact, uh, Lyndon, just so people know a little bit about who you are, uh, what's your official title in Māori Anglican circles? Well, Anglicans love these titles. So I'm the Venerable Dr. Lyndon Drake in, in that setting. And I'm the Archdeacon of Tāmaki Makoto. But the easy way to think about it is that I'm Anglican Middle Management. So, <laughs> I like the title. I, I wonder if we could do that here at Grace City. Can, can, what's I mean, what's yeah. the title again? Venerable. I mean, it sounds, it sounds quite cool, actually. That does sound very yeah. cool. That does sound very cool. I've got some other questions here, just so we get to know a little bit about who you are. Uh, you're married to Miriam, uh, who's She's just at the front here, along with your beautiful children. Uh, what's one of the many traits you love about Miriam? Well, one of the things that grabbed me about her, she's now quite embarrassed. Yeah. Um, one of the things that really grabbed me about her was her ability and desire to connect with people who are outside the church and outside the Christian faith. So I'm a terrible personal evangelist. I try, but I fail. Mim succeeds where I fail, and that's awesome. I um, actually remember that uh, when, because uh, you guys were part of Grace City for a few months yeah. between being a Baptist tab and uh, doing what you're doing now, and uh, just to see some of the connections that, that you made in a very short time. It's outstanding. It was, I, I actually want to say thank you, because it was a season of, of rest and refreshment for us, and um, we deeply valued our time here. Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, favorite place here in Tamaki Makoto? It's Kohimarama Beach, and I have a particular chair that I get annoyed about if somebody's <laughs> sitting on it. And it's actually one of my favorite places in the whole world. So if somebody was sitting in that chair, what would you do? Well, you can pray for my sanctification so that I don't feel the feelings that I actually feel. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Lyndon, you were an investment banker in London before you're doing what you're doing now. So, so why did you change? Why well, did you yeah, I mean, look, I looked at the church and I thought there's better pay, the working conditions are so much better. No, no, like, really? <laughs> yeah, that's not true, um, just in case you were wondering. Um, no, we'd been, Miriam and I had been involved in, in church life um, in a bunch of ways over the years, and uh, we, we just had a sense that there were particular things um, that we could do within that space that, that um, God had in mind for us to do. And so um, we eventually came to the, the point where we moved across uh, from one world into a very different world, but still connected. It's wonderful. Uh, so you don't just have one doctorate, you have two doctorates. Mm, I wouldn't recommend that. So uh, do, do we call you Dr. Doctor in, in addition to the, you know, title I mean, please, before? Please do, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I've genuinely considered moving to Germany because in, in German-speaking countries, they will use both titles. Oh. And so, that, whereas in New Zealand, people go, Lyndon, I thought all those years of study, what a waste. <laughs> so, um, exactly. Um, so what, why after, you know, because a doctor is so hard to pursue and, and graduate from anyway, why would you do that again? Well, when I was doing the second one, my wife especially would, why are you doing another one? And um, no, the, part of my conviction, and, and my bishop has really um, pushed me towards this as well, is that our conviction is that the situation in the church in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and more broadly, is one in which it would really help to go below the waterline a bit more, to dig into the theological setting, to think hard um, and prayerfully about the scriptures, um, about theology, and then how we can uh, use that to help serve the church in ways that uh, we can participate in God's mission. And for all of the, the hassle of doing it, that's been my experience as well. It's been life-giving to me personally, um, and it's I think and I hope has informed then how we've engaged in church ministry. It's wonderful. Uh, so we're part of this series called Something Bigger. Mm. And the reason I've invited Lyndon to speak today is for us to at Grace City to realize we're not the only church in Auckland. There's like a thousand churches in our city and God is doing some amazing things in churches all around Tamaki Makoto. Yeah. And especially in Māori Anglican. And so I have known uh, Lyndon and Bishop Kito for many years now. Uh, we're forming some, some beautiful uh, relationships and partnerships now with Auckland Church Network as we work together for the social and spiritual flourishing of our city. And so, Lyndon, as, as, as you think about Māori Anglican for a moment, mm. uh, what are some of those, I guess, nuggets where you see God really at work? And amidst all the challenges, mm. where, where do you see God at work? Well, I mean, for many people here, um, you won't spend a great deal of time, if any, in, in the Maori world. And that's absolutely fine. God calls each of us to different spaces. But within that Maori world, the Maori Anglican Church 
often has an invitation to speak words of life, gospel words into those spaces that's not available to everybody else. And one of the joys for me over the last few years has been to see the way that God has opened that door in new ways. So we've, we've pushed very much into uh, seeing Maori evangelists um, take the word from outside of our church doors um, and onto marae. And then it's, I, I cannot oversell this, okay? It's, it's little shoots of new life. It's not the flourishing that we long to see. But we have seen whole communities in some cases turn to the Lord, give their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and I, I just invite you to pray for that. We've, the sense of fellowship that we have across these different churches with different vocations within the city um, is one that I think can be a real picture of our fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can pray for you um, and you can pray for us in these different spaces. Well, let's, uh, let's stop right now and pray for, for you and for the leaders of Māori Anglican. Thank you. So God's continued yeah. blessing. Thanks, John. Uh, so Jesus... Thank you for your church across our city, the Capital C Church. And thank you for the role uh, Bishop Keto and Lyndon play in raising up leaders uh, and evangelists uh, across Marais, across uh, churches throughout our city and, and further north. Mm. And pray you would continue to raise up workers for the harvest. Yes, Lord. You would continue to bring health and growth and flourishing. Uh, the Māori throughout, um, throughout this area would come to faith, would come to find hope and peace in this good news of the gospel yes, Lord. that changes absolutely everything. And as Lyndon shares today from your word, the Bible, uh, would you grant us ears to hear uh, what you have to say? Mm. Thanks, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jonathan. Well, if you've got a Bible with you, um, I'd invite you to turn to Matthew's Gospel and to chapter 13. Uh, I'm going to read from there. You'll notice that I've, I've tried to dress for the church setting, so I've, I've got rid of my Anglican clothes, and you can tell me afterwards if I've got it right for dressing for this setting here. Um, but nevertheless, we are brothers and sisters, and we have the same things happening in our church. So we're going to read the Word of God together, um, and then after that, we're coming to communion. And so I feel completely at home here among you. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 13 and beginning at verse 31. Here is another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree and birds come and make, its nests, in, make nests in its branches. Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman put, uh, used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Jesus always used stories and illustrations like these when speaking to the crowds. In fact, he never spoke to them without using such parables. This fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet. I will speak to you in parables. I will explain things hidden since the creation of the world. Shall we pray together? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I wonder if you know, a little quiz question to kick things off, I wonder if you know when church attendance peaked in Aotearoa, New Zealand, when the most people went to church. And it's not a real quiz because I'm going to tell you the answer. And it was in about 1860. Around 1860, according to research done by Malcolm Falloon, about 80% of the entire population of the country was in weekly Christian worship. 80% in church every week. And of course, at that time, most of the population was Maori. And what had happened, and that story of what had happened, I think is still deeply relevant today. In case you haven't noticed, the situation is not the same today. Now, what's happened, of course, in the intervening years, back then, large numbers of Maori had turned to Christ. This was the outcome of many years of hard work and earnest prayer, 
It was led largely by Maori evangelists who heard the gospel from those early missionaries and then went back to their own whānau, their own families, their own tribes, and told them of this good news that they'd encountered about the Lord Jesus. The turning point that took that wonderful story and led to the ongoing decline of the church was the invasion of the Waikato, which began not too far from here as Great South Road was built so that the troops could go down there and invade. This led to a rapid decline as people saw what they perceived as the hypocrisy of the church and those who professed allegiance to Jesus Christ but engaged in violence. And so many Maori turned away from the church. In fact, in human terms, the church in this land has never actually recovered from that blow. It has continued to shrink. And these days, in proportional terms, is shrinking even more rapidly than in the past. So I'm a bit of a maths geek and I love charts, but I can't say that I really love the chart of Christian allegiance or of Christian attendance in this land because it's a downward sloping one and it's not what I long to see. It's in that situation that we encounter these two parables of Jesus. They're intended to give us hope. We're invited to compare our own situation today, the smallness of the church, with the situation of Jesus' own disciples, the very few of them. They didn't have any reason to hope back then. But in Jesus' words, they were given by him a hope. And it's a hope that is still actually bearing fruit today. Now, as you've heard, I'm part of the Anglican Church. And when you look at us as an institution, we're a little bit like the Titanic. So we're sinking fast and deep. You might have seen that there's even some church buildings for sale around the city, and you might have heard of congregations that were shrinking. Those things are true. Now, my sense is that you are in a different space. You're not the Titanic. I'm sure you're pleased to hear. This community, in, in one sense, can be a boat that offers life out beyond itself. But our task is actually to some degree to think about the church collectively, to think about how the multitude of people, the vast majority of people in our land, who do not follow Jesus Christ, can come to hear of him and find life in him. At the moment, there's actually no visible sign of the kind of turning to Christ that would lead to that happen, happening, humanly speaking, I'm talking about. To re-evangelize our country, we would actually need to see churches that were multiplying each year on a scale that's similar to those who are already in them. When I look around the country, we can't see that happening yet for all that we praise God for the green shoots that we can see. We will know that the church is growing again when we can see it multiplying like that, but we are not in that space yet. So when you consider the huge scale of that challenge, we this morning need the hope that Jesus gives to us in these parables. We do need to recognize that our situation looks similar to the smallness of the disciples' situation. Like those disciples, we look a bit more like a mustard seed than a giant tree. Like them, humanly speaking, we don't actually have much hope of transforming this land, of carrying out the mission that Jesus has invited us to be part of. And like them, like those first disciples, we need the hope of Jesus' parables here in order to be able to carry on with that work. Now, I wonder if you noticed in that story of the mustard seed that it's a little bit odd and incongruous. Jesus says that it grows to become a tree on which flocks of birds are ending up nesting. Now, I'm a terrible gardener. I don't know much about it. And while I do know that a mustard seed is big, it's not, strictly speaking, a tree. When Jesus tells parables, it's often those little odd moments where the story takes a twist that point us towards what he's trying to get across to us. The picture Jesus is painting is not actually a particularly logical one. It's a picture of something extraordinary, of something that is in a sense unnatural and unexpected. This mustard seed becomes something bigger than it naturally would. The same is going to be true of those early disciples and of us. A normal plant becomes something bigger 
a massive tree. Jesus was assuring those disciples that all of their hopes, their longings to see the kingdom of God come about, were going to come true, but they were actually going to come true out of the very unimpressive little group of them. If you read through the rest of Matthew's gospel, and Jonathan and I were talking before, even the story afterwards, these disciples are not actually the dream team. They look a lot more like us than they do like Jesus, and I take great comfort from that. Jesus is reassuring them that if they were to take a long and honest look at themselves, they would go, we can't do it. And maybe we this morning can say the same thing, we can't do it. And Jesus is giving them hope about where they're going to be. The disciples could see that they did look like a mustard seed. They longed for Israel to be a tree which would offer shelter and life to the whole world. Jesus was telling them, that their current insignificance and smallness and the hope that Jesus is talking about are actually not just connected because they're in a storyline, but they're connected in the way that Jesus is going to act. So two commentators on Matthew's gospel, Davies and Allison, they put it like this. Our parable is an invitation to contemplate these two things, the present and the expected future, reality and hope. In the light of the mustard seed story, the point is this. Despite all appearances, between the minute beginning and the grand culmination, there is an organic unity. Indeed, the one, the tree, the end of the story is an effect of the other, the seed, God's activity in Jesus and his disciples. The end is found in the beginning. So Jesus is telling them in this parable that the way the disciples are now, their smallness, their insignificance, their inability to do ministry well, it's actually in that way that his kingdom is going to grow into this great tree. Hunzinger, who's another commentator, says this, the kingdom is already present in sign in the contemporary work of Jesus, even though it's now concealed and inconspicuous. The aim of the parable is that this inconspicuous presence should not be an offense, but it is a guarantee of confidence. In the concealment of present demonstrations of God's power lies the promise of an imminent, victorious exercise of his dominion. So the point of the parable is not just to tell us to hope, it's not just to give us hope, in what might look like a hopeless situation. It's actually an encouragement to Jesus' first disciples to embrace the smallness of the community of the disciples and then to make that the pattern for their own ongoing ministry. In other words, this parable is a template for how the church is to continue to behave as it does start to show signs of growing into a great tree. Jesus' disciples in all generations, including our own, are to embrace Jesus' own pattern of ministry, its smallness, its marginal status, its apparent insignificance. That's the connection with this parable of yeast that comes straight afterwards. Just like I'm not a very good gardener, I'm not a great cook either, but even I know that yeast never turns out to look very impressive, but still it's the way in which the loaf grows. The church is meant to be like yeast. It's to spread in ways that remain looking insignificant. It's to multiply in ways that embrace the powerlessness that Jesus embraced. Last night, um, on on Saturday nights, we've got a family tradition. It's not a very spiritual one. We watch a movie and we have pizza, which my wife wonderfully makes for us. And Last night we had some friends over and we watched the first Dune movie, which is a great movie. Or well, in my opinion it is anyway. And our friends hadn't, some of our friends hadn't seen it before and one of the kids commentated, commented on it that this, this movie has a kind of religious feel to it. And, and my friend um, said to his kids, yeah, well, that's because it's telling the story of a Messiah, a Messiah figure who's gonna come and rescue the universe in that movie. And I I just think there's something in us that longs for that. We can see the world's not the way it's meant to be, and we're longing for there to be a hero, 
a Messiah who's going to change the world and make it right. I think the risk is that when we read these stories, part of us also longs that we might be that one. Sometimes we long that our community might be that place, or one of our leaders might be that hero figure. The parable of the yeast reminds us that the work of Jesus is going to be spread by people on the whole who are going to be forgotten. People who don't look significant, who don't look like they're gonna be able to achieve it. It's telling us, if we go back to that first parable, that the growth of this enormous tree is going to happen in quite a hidden way. It's not going to have those hero figures. And part of our calling as the church is to always, and in every generation, actually embrace the hiddenness of hope as our way of being and in our practice of mission. So as we think about these two parables and we try to move from Jesus' own situation to our ours, I've got to our situation, oh, I've got three things I'd love us to take away and reflect on. Jesus hasn't just told us to be hopeful, he's telling us this so that we will go and act out that hope. The first thing I want us to think about is this image of the birds of the air coming and nesting in the branches of the tree. The picture Jesus is painting with that is of the tree of Israel becoming a home for the nations of the world, the hope of Israel for the world coming true. So in a sense, this morning, we here, more broadly in the church in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we're one of those birds nesting, or perhaps a few of those birds in our different groups, nesting in the branches of the tree. We've been brought in from outside. In other words, I want to remind us that we can see that the promise of Jesus to Israel is coming true in what we can see in the present. We do recognize the smallness and insignificance, but when we zoom out, we can see the greatness of the tree that Jesus is growing. When you look at the whole world these days, we've gone from 12, actually after a little while, 11 disciples maybe, to these days there being about two billion people who in some sense would profess an allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you do not have to be an amazing mathematician to tell that 12 going down to 11 and two billion is a really extraordinary story. That even though we do look forward to the Lord's return and that great tree being truly revealed, we can see that Jesus is growing that tree now in the present age. You also don't have to be some noted theologian to realize that the hopes of Israel of being part of the redemption of the world are coming true through the church as the nations find rest in the branches of the tree that's being grown by Israel's Messiah. So we are some of those birds. We're nesting in that tree. We have found hope there, Maori and Tauiwi, those other groups who are living in this land. We are now finding rest and renewal in the branches of the tree of life that Jesus is growing for the world. This parable ought not to just be a story in the past that instructs us to have hope. It's one where we can look at the evidence in the world around us and see that despite our own fragile situation in this land, God's greater tree is growing rapidly. Our own place, our own fragility, actually can be part of us recognizing that we're still part of that much greater story. Now, if that's true, that also ought to give us the confidence to think about the parable of the yeast and to embrace Jesus' ways of doing ministry. We can actually uh, push into that ourselves. I want to use an example here of Jonathan. As he said, we've known each other for quite a few years now. As you get older, the years start to tick up quite a bit. And I can tell you from my observation of the church in this land that he is an exceptional and an unusual leader. There are very few Christian ministers in our land who are gifted in the way that he is to lead a church of this size. Now, we need places like this. We need you, not least to resource the church and to send on outwards from here. 
But I wonder if every now and then you've thought, maybe we need a few more Jonathans, and you started to notice that there's not so many. I want to say to you this morning, don't lose heart because of that. Jonathan's rarity is actually a gift to us. It's unlikely that you're going to find, I've been looking around for plenty of others like him, and I I try to recruit them if I can. But I've realized we are, our hope is not in finding many more like him. Instead, it's in the insignificance of people like the disciples. And we can hope that we will see many of them go out into many places of ministry, like the yeast, in their insignificance, in their story that might never be told. And we can expect and hope that Jesus will do his work of growing that tree through them. If re-evangelizing Aotearoa New Zealand was dependent on finding 20 people like Jonathan, I might actually be tempted to despair. But it's not. We are invited to pray into this parable of the yeast. It's an encouragement amongst us to pray into Jesus' way of doing things. I was at a conference last year with my bishop, um, and they invited Archbishop Rowan Williams to reflect. They said to him, what can you tell us about leadership? And he said, well, when you look at the New Testament, it actually has virtually nothing to say about leadership, but it has an awful lot to say about service and humility. Some of what we were singing about in that song earlier. Jesus repeatedly calls his disciples to that model of service, to that model of how we act as a church. It's what he does with the disciples. And Jesus, of course, was the one true hero who could have remained in direct control of the church. And I tell you what, sometimes I really wish he had, not least when I know that I'm not capable. But he chose to entrust the church to these insignificant people, And if you've read the Gospels, you'll know the story of that. And I want to encourage you that we too can entrust the Gospel to each other, to those people who don't look like they fit the bill. That's actually how Aotearoa New Zealand was evangelized the first time round. It was entrusted to people who did not look significant. We have a chant in in our church that we use uh, to remember that story. It begins like this. I'm not going to do the whole thing because it's long. He kapu taku ringa, he taonga te nei nanga tupuna, he poi, he poi, he poi hei. It's saying there's a treasure in our hands, and that's the good news of Jesus Christ. And in this land, it went out like the poi does in a poi chant, flew out from place to place. And the image of the poi is used there of those people who heard the good news of Jesus and went to their own families, went to their own tribes, their iwi, and told them about Jesus. It names some of those people. I'm pretty sure most of you have never heard these names. Rota Waitoa, Te Tauri, Taumatakura, and others. And you don't need to have heard them to recognize in that this parable of yeast. There's a sense in which this is how the church is meant to be. This is how Jesus intends the church to multiply. And I want to encourage you this morning to see that you are part of that bigger story and to put your trust in God's way of doing things. We are a people who ought to never aspire to be the heroes of the story. We're a people as Christians who can embrace being a church of small things, of insignificant ministries, and of people who lack power and status in our society. To be part of Jesus' story, to share in his hope, your calling will be to find ways to express that to become more and more like that, to shape others who will be able to go out from this place and to use this wonderful large space here to send out into many other small spaces, to be the means here of seeing the yeast go out and transform the whole loaf. And lastly, and I only want to touch on this very briefly, Within the wider context of Matthew's Gospels, these parables occur within the wider story of Jesus that Matthew's telling. And within that, Jesus repeatedly emphasizes the need for his followers to exemplify the righteousness that he calls people to. In some way, the church in New Zealand must reflect on the fact that we have not looked like the branch of the tree that Jesus was setting up. In that story I told of the invasion of the Waikato, 
that invites us to reflect on our own part within that wider story and to seek to find ways to express repentance for our collective complicity in that story and to be part of embodying the good news of Jesus as well as of telling of him in our words. That's something which I just want to leave with you. When we reflect on the smallness of our situation within the wide setting of Aotearoa New Zealand, it would actually be very easy for us to lose sight of our hope. And I want to end by saying this, our hope does not come because of us. It comes from the one who spoke these parables to those disciples. Our hope comes from the fact that we've been freed from the ignorance and the unbelief that is the default setting of humanity. We have been invited, as we've read these words from the gospel, we've been invited to join in with the company of those first disciples. We have been brought into the beauty and the hope of Jesus' great story. Jesus is the sower of the seed. Jesus is the one whose power is growing that mustard seed into a great tree of life to offer shelter and renewal for the world. Jesus is the one who has given us a place of rest in its branches. Jesus is the one who inspires in every generation a willingness to embrace the hidden life that he calls the church to in her mission. And Jesus is the one who empowers his followers to go on and give life to others. Jesus is our hope. Will you join with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for sending the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he spoke these words of hope. Father, we thank you that Jesus is enthroned in heaven, that he sits in the glory and majesty that will one day be revealed when he returns. So Father, as we come in a moment to share in communion, we pray that by your spirit, you would lift us up to heaven where Christ does reign in glory and that you would feed us on him so that we are able to go out into your world and to be what you've called us to be. We ask this in the name of our dear Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.